position full-time that summer after school. I was 22 years old, and two weeks after they hired me, the senior minister there had a heart attack. So even though I was just a weekend youth minister still attending school, suddenly I had to preach every Sunday morning and help out with other senior minister duties as well. One of those was to help with the mother-daughter banquet. I organized the meal and men to, to serve the meal. And on the Sunday afternoon, we had it. Over 100 women uh, attended. And before the meal, I stepped up in front of those women to say the prayer. And I prayed and then stepped back toward the kitchen. Toward the kitchen and one of the elders quickly whispered in my ear, Your zipper is down. I prayed in front of 100 or so women with my zipper down. Well, perhaps you've done something similar, and you have felt what I felt that day. It's what the Bible calls shame. Shame can lead us to believe we just can't do things right, we just can't measure up, can even lead us to believe that because of our sin, because of our struggles, because of our failures, that God cannot love us, that God cannot forgive us. Shame can lead us to those type of feelings. Well, as we continue our series, Under My Skin, we come to John chapter 4 this morning. And as I mentioned last week, we're going to look at Jesus through this, service, through this series as he interacts with four individuals. Last week, we looked at Jesus in John chapter 3 getting under the skin of Nicodemus. This week, we're going to look at a conversation that Jesus had with a woman. A woman who had said some things and done some things that led her to feel shame. However, Jesus gets under her skin. So if you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, let's start with the first four verses this morning. It says, Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although he, in fact, was not baptizing them, but his disciples were baptizing him. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. Now do not miss this important part of this passage. Notice it says Jesus had to go through Samaria. This phrase makes you think he had only one route to go from Judea to Galilee. One route through Samaria. However, that was not the case at all. You could go, easily go around Samaria. This, in fact, Jewish people, that's what they did. They went around Samaria. They did not go through to Samaria. Jews hated Samaritans, and Samaritans hated Jews. In fact, if a Jew passed a Samaritan on the street and dust from the feet of, this, of the Samaritan somehow landed on the clothing of the Jew... They were considered unclean. They were not allowed in the temple to worship until they went home and washed their clothing or changed their clothing. That's how much tension existed between the Jews and the Samaritans. Even the dust from a Samaritan couldn't get on a Jew. Well, perhaps you have someone in your life that has hurt you deeply, that has said something bad about you, done something to your family, uh, perhaps someone that considers you enemy. What happens when you see them in the store? What happens? Uh, often, people will turn around and go a different direction, do they not? They try to avoid them. They, they go around. It's not that you don't want to be mean to the person. It's the fact that they're hard to like, and you really don't want to have to fake nice, so you just avoid and go around. It's like driving an extra half hour just to avoid going anywhere close to Ann Arbor, Michigan. All right? You just want to go around. That is what would happen when a Jew or a Samaritan saw each other. They, they would avoid all conflict. Uh, they, they would avoid all contact. They, they would go around. So why does John write Jesus had to go through Samaria? Because in the heart of Jesus, there was this passion, this great desire to go through Samaria. The love and compassion in his heart would not allow him to go around Samaria. In fact, Jesus, in his heart, 
He knew he was here for all mankind, not just for Jews, but for Samaritans and Gentiles alike. So he wanted to get under everyone's skin. So he had to go through Samaria. Notice next in our passage, 5 and 6. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sakar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. Now John is being generous here, calling Sychar a town. There were only a few dozen people who lived in Sychar at that time. It was more like a small village. However, in this town was a well called Jacob's Well. It had been dug centuries before, and it was over a hundred foot deep. The, the well provided water for thousands of people throughout the years. However, today, it's been filled with some rock, and it actually only produces water in the wintertime today. However, the amazing thing is, the well is still there. The actual well is still there, there today, and it's one of only a small list of places on earth we know for certain that Jesus visited. And we know for certain if you go there to that well, you're within five feet of where Jesus Christ once stood. Well, we notice next in our passage a sinful woman from Samaria. Notice in verse 7 of John chapter 4. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Now, not only did the, the two races hate each other to, to the point that she would make this comment, you, I can't believe you're asking me for a drink, but we also noticed this morning that Jesus is a man, and the Samaritan plainly says, I'm a woman. Jewish men did not speak to women, Jewish women, Samaritan women, any women in public. They would not even speak to their own wives in public. On top of this, Jesus is asking her for a drink from her cup, a cup any Jew would conclude was unclean. So this story deals with men and women, religious and non-religious, Jewish laws, and people with different color skin. This is Jax and his, Jax and his good friend, Reddy. They were first graders and best friends when this picture was taken. Before this picture was taken, Jack's mom told him he needed a haircut, and his mom, Linda Rosebush, posted a picture of them and wrote the following on Facebook. Perhaps you've seen it. She writes, This morning, Jax and I were discussing his wild hair. I told him that he needed a haircut this weekend. He said that he wanted his head shaved really short so he could look like his friend Reddy. He said he couldn't wait to go to school Monday with his hair like Reddy's, so that his teacher wouldn't be able to tell them apart. He thought it would be so hilarious to confuse his teacher with the same haircut. If this is not proof that hatred is something that is taught, I don't know what is, she writes, because the only difference Jack sees in the two of them is the length of their hair. Jesus can see the shock on this woman's face because she's treating He's treating her like an equal. He should not be talking to her, coming any place close to her. But I believe Jesus could also see the shame in her heart. Look at verse 10. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So in this woman's mind, I imagine she immediately thinks after he says this, you cannot give me any kind of water. You can't even give yourself a water, any water. You have no water jar. You just, she's probably thinking, you just asked me to get you water. So she asks, verse 12, where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Now think about it. Jesus has just walked 30 miles from Judea to Galilee on dusty roads. It's hot. It's in the middle of the day. Jesus is thirsty. However, as thirsty as Jesus is, <clears throat> this woman has a greater thirst. Look at verses 13 and 14. 
Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Now, the word Jesus uses for spring here means vibrant, powerful, moving water. It's not stagnant well water. She is walking to this well every day at noon to get lukewarm water. So what she says next makes a whole lot of sense. Verse 15. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Now, it's noon when Jesus and the Samaritan woman have this conversation at the well. I want to tell you something. People did not go to wells at noon in the heat of the day. They just didn't. They went in the morning. They went in the evening. They would not have gone at noon. I believe she's there at noon and desires to never come back again because she's known as a sinner. People look at her. People judge. People go around. Even her own people go around her. Well, she asks for this water, and Jesus answers her, and he starts with seven words. Verse 16, go call your husband and come back. This woman's first statement to Jesus was 11 words. Her next comment to Jesus was 13 words. Her next comment to Jesus was 42 words. Jesus has this inviting, loving way about him. She had gotten comfortable. However, after these seven words from Jesus, she only responds with four. Verse 17, I have no husband. She'd gotten comfortable. Now the walls come back up. She's not comfortable all of a sudden. Jesus says to her something that's going to make her perhaps even a little more uncomfortable. Verse 17 and 18, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband, what you, have said, what you have just said is quite true. Now, many people for years have liked to use the, word, the term premarital sex, which obviously means having sex before marriage. However, the more I read up on marriage and what the Bible says about marriage, the more it leads me to conclude that there's no such thing as premarital sex. There's no such thing. In biblical days, a couple would go through a ceremony And then they would go into what was called the marriage tent, and they would consummate the marriage. They were not considered married until this act was done. After the two became one flesh, at that point in the eyes of God, they were married. The more I read and the more I'm led to believe, the more I read, the more I'm led to believe that when two people, a man and a woman, become one flesh, in the eyes of God, they're married. They're married. God's not really concerned about what the country of India requires for a marriage license or what the state of Ohio requires for a marriage license. God always goes beyond that which is worldly. And this is why Jesus says, you have had five husbands, and who you are with now is not your husband. I believe it was not her husband because those two had not become one flesh. So she was about to have six husbands, However, Jesus reaches out to save her, forgive her. He had come to Samaria. He had had to go through Samaria for just that. You see, Jesus had this way of speaking the truth that did not lead a person to shame, humiliation, or judgment. It led them to change. This lady has told the truth, has been told the truth about her life, even though this is the first time she's ever met Jesus. She's also been told the truth about salvation. And the story shares that when she heard about this salvation, when she heard Jesus speaking in this way, suddenly she left her water jar and she started running into town. She was running into town, going up to everyone, saying, come and see the man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? This woman who came to the well at noon every day to avoid contact with people, is now running up to people to tell them that this could be the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Notice how the story ends, John 4, 39 through 42. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. 
And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is, don't miss this, the Savior of the world. A bunch of Samaritans have concluded that this is the Savior of the world. Isn't that amazing? These foreigners believed what Jewish religious leaders were refusing to believe, that Jesus was the Savior of the world. Last week we saw a man slowly move toward Jesus. This morning we notice a, man, a, a woman who runs to tell everyone of Jesus. She's gone from shame to salvation. You see, your sin, my sin, doesn't drive Jesus away from us. It draws Jesus to us. We all have skin in the game. Times we've messed up, times we've failed, times we've sinned. We all have sin in our life. However, this story tells us that Jesus wants to save us despite of our sin. Jesus came from heaven to earth to bring heaven to earth. And heaven on earth means three things. Number one, no favoritism. No favoritism. Jesus doesn't care if you're rich or poor, educated or uneducated, young or old, doesn't care what, you, what job you have, what house you live in, what car you drive. Jesus doesn't care about the clothes you wear, as long as they're modest. Doesn't care what success you have or if you've done nothing but fail. Jesus doesn't care if the world sees you as a pretty good person or an evil sinner that has to go to the well at noon. He shows no favoritism. Paul writes in Romans, God does not show favoritism. Peter preaches in Acts, God does not show favoritism. And then listen to these words from James. James chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. James wrote, Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes. If you show special attention to the man wearing the fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? You know, I shared this before. However, I felt like it fits. So I wanted to share it again. But my mother is a southern woman, and she believes in manners and wearing and saying the right things, the correct things at the right time. We not only got in trouble for curse words, we, we got in trouble for saying slang words as well uh, when I was growing up. And Every church my mom has attended, she's been very faithful, and the people in the church have loved her. And a few years back, her minister was doing a, a sermon on loving others, and he asked my mom, the most unlikely person in the church, to dress up like a homeless person and come in for worship. So they dressed her up, and she came into church that Sunday, and no one recognized her. I mean, she looked bad, she looked homeless, uh, a little scary even. And, and she came in about 10 minutes early and she took a seat up toward the front of the auditorium. And guess what happened? No one sat next to her. No one greeted her. No one came around her. They all just kind of sat and whispered and stared. Well, when the preacher revealed who she actually was during the sermon, there was a gasp. And I imagine there was also some shame. We show favoritism God does not. And that's good news this morning because we're all sinners. We are all a mess. Compared to the righteousness of Jesus, we're a mess. We're, we're unworthy. We fall short. And because of the skin we've lost in this life, this game called life, we're a mess. And yet Jesus wants to not only get under our skin, he wants to heal us. You see, if Jesus would speak with bring salvation to forgive and get under the skin of a Samaritan woman with five husbands, he will do the same for you no matter what you have done, no matter what your skin looks like. Well, we notice next, heaven on earth means no sexism. You know, I was watching a part of a Sunday morning news show recently that Stephanie had recorded, and the show did a special segment on the fact that we have over 5,000 statues in America, commemorating the accomplishments of people 
However, only 400 of them are of women. 400 out of 5,000. You know what the world screams for equality for all genders today is it was already happening way back uh, at the beginning when the church was established. It, it was happening in the kingdom of heaven. Rodney Starks writes, Recent objective evidence leads no doubt that early Christian women did enjoy far greater equality with men than did their pagan and Jewish counterparts. A study of Christian burials in the catacombs under Rome based on 3,733 cases found that Christian women were as likely as Christian men to be commemorated with lengthy inscriptions. This equality in the commemoration of males and females is something peculiar with Christians and sets them apart from the non-Christian populations of the cities of that day. Paul would write about this, Galatians 3, 26 through 29. So, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized in the Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now don't get me wrong, God's word establishes uh, kind of the structure of life. God first, uh, the man uh, is to love his wife, the wife, is to respect, uh, submit in some ways to her husband. There's, there's, there's that kind of information in the Bible. Paul's not calling us to go away from the Word of God, but he's saying when it comes to the church, when it comes to faith, when it comes to being saved, a Jew can be saved, a Gentile can be saved, a slave can be saved, saved a, a master can be slaved, uh, or saved, a, a man can be slaved, saved a woman can be saved. Uh, now this was earth-shattering and groundbreaking in the first century, and I believe it's a little bit earth-shattering and groundbreaking today. God wants us to love all people and to be there for each other. No matter race, slave or free, male or female, we're all made one in Christ Jesus. Heaven on earth, no favoritism, no sexism, and then we notice heaven on earth means no racism. Someone said, there will not be a single racist in heaven, however, hell will be full of them. That's kind of a scary, scary line for, for many people, isn't it? How do we know that's accurate? Well, Revelation 7, 9, and 10. John writes, after this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from every tribe, from every people, and from every language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were all wearing white robes, and they were all holding palm branches in their hands, and they were all crying out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Every tribe, every nation, every people, every language, men and women, standing before their God. Katie Cork was interviewing an older black man and an older white man during her news show on one occasion, and the men spoke of how they had become friends. They met fishing uh, on the same pier in San Diego every day. While fishing day after day, they learned that they both had served in World War II. They both had been married for, for over 40 years. They both had children and grandchildren they were extremely proud of. They fished every day. However, one day the older white man did not show up. The next day he was back and he told the older black man that he had cancer without a kidney tr transplant. He would die. Well, the older black man went home, couldn't sleep, got up the next morning, couldn't eat his breakfast. Not eating his breakfast, his wife got a little worried and said, you know, what's wrong? And he told his wife about his friend. And he said, my friend needs a kidney, and I think I'm going to give my friend one of my kidneys. Well, she got negative right, right off the bat. You're older, you need your kidneys. What if you give one and your other one gives out? You're probably not the right blood type. It will probably not be a good match. But he couldn't stand aside. He went and got tested. 
found out he had the same blood type, found out his kidney was a great match, and this older black man gave this older white man his kidney. Well, trying to understand all this, Katie Couric asked, why? Why would you give someone one of your kidneys? His answer, if we do not help one another, who will? Who will? You know, as Christians, God calls us to help. To help build the kingdom of heaven. To help Jesus get under every color of skin. Male or female, Jew or Gentile, slave or free. We are, a follower. we are followers of a man who had to go through Samaria, had to go to a cross, had to go to a tomb, and then raised and got to go to the right hand of God. As Christians, we're not to hate people. We're to love people, all people. We're to love and help them because if the Christian will not, who will? Annie Lamont shares these, these words. She writes, You can safely assume that you have created God in your image when it turns out God hates all the same people you do. Well, God doesn't hate anybody. Anybody. He wants to get under everybody's skin. Well, as the worship leaders come this morning, if you have a decision to make this morning, I, I encourage you to do so as we stand together and sing. Let's, let's sing this morning.